So we're used to standardized tests and those may be necessary to qualify the student for services. Um, but they are they really don't help much when you're talking about what do I do day to day? How do I make those goals and objectives on his or her IEP work and have them be successful? I'm sure some of you may have sat, sat through IEPs, especially those of us who maybe provide um, uh, services like OTs, PTs, SLPs. Um, and what happens is we end up um, We end, we, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this, but what we do is we end up not actually using that information and we don't have the information to know what to go on. So adopting an authentic assessment approach means that you're gonna understand how that student's abilities, their interests, their likes and dislikes, their temperament. Are they a student who is like easy? They go along with the flow or is this a child who has a very, difficult time with change. The use of their sensory channels, which ones are working better for them? And then the surroundings will influence how the child communicates and learns. So how I gather assessment information and how I use it is going to look quite different than it does for many other people because that's the kind of information I need to develop a program that is not going to have that child be miserable at school all day long. And hopefully we'll be happy to be in school and excited and learning. And we did um, give you a, a handout called Authentic Assessment that was developed at the, um, the National uh, Center on Deaf Blindness. And uh, it's, it's excellent because it gives some ex some points for you to think about and also some examples of students and how they used authentic assessment. And so authentic assessment is communication, social interaction, the motor skills of the child, the type and the severity of the vision and hearing levels, the likes and dislikes, which sensory channels work best for them, their temperament, cognitive development, Activities, places, people, and times of the day in which the student functions best. If that student's getting medication in the morning right before he comes to school and it makes him tired and he sleeps the first hour, that's important to know. Situations that present difficulties for the student. What happens, um, I'm just thinking of an example that I had. I didn't know that this little boy didn't like um animal sounds and I took something that had animal sounds in it and I made him cry. And um, if I had asked the kinds of questions that we're talking about right now, first, um, I wouldn't have had to go home and change my hair color, <laughs> change my clothes, change my perfume and come back and try again. So there's also another handout uh, that we gave you and it is simply a simple questionnaire and it's things that I, want you to know about how my child communicates. How does she communicate? And it's just some simple things that parents can check off and say, this is how my child is communicating. And because sometimes parents will say one thing about communication, and then it's only later that someone says something and they go, oh yeah, I did forgot to tell you. Yeah, she, yeah she'll, she'll do that. And she'll, she'll let you know that that's what she wants but they didn't think to say. And that's one of the nice things about this quest quick questionnaire is it really covers a lot of things. And a, a lot of it is based actually on the communication matrix, which we will talk about um, in the third session. What is this student's cognitive level? I'll hear people ask that question. So here's my first question for you. What do you want to know when you're looking for a student's cognitive level and why? I want you to think about that. What, what does my knowing the cognitive level of the student tell me about what I should or shouldn't teach, how I should or shouldn't teach? So in some cases, I'm thinking about uh, uh, a school psychologist who did not have experience with any children who had both a vision and hearing loss 
And, you know, she was talking about the child's cognitive level. And I said, and so that's based on a test that was not designed for children who have vision and hearing problems. And she said, well, that's true. And I, I said, and that's really important for you to say. So think about those kinds of things. What does cognitive mean? You know, one of the things I think about cognitive level is can this child solve a problem? And I don't mean a math problem. I mean, can they solve a problem of trying to get to something? Have they figured out how to use a stick to push something? Those are the kinds of things I start looking for. Do they have a sense of humor that you can figure out what the humor is about? So think about why you want to know that cognitive level. Because so many times our children are mislabeled and people think that they have a mental handicap when, yes, you'd have a mental handicap too if you couldn't see and hear stuff. But that doesn't mean that you really have a mental handicap. So we really want to caution you about that issue of cognitive skills. Kathy was getting at that, you know, standardized assessments are not appropriate for children who are deaf blind. It doesn't consider the impact of um, a dual sensory disability. And so uh, our hope over these next few days is to give you guys some other assessments that you can add um, into your assessments. Sometimes you may need to do a standardized assessment for qualifying a student. Um, but hopefully you can include some additional information that is focused on what the student can do, what their likes are, what their what brings out their personality, um, how we can best support them so they have access to the curriculum. Um, I think about parents who unfortunately sit through a lot of meetings where they are hearing what their child can't do um, or you know this low score that their child has received and how hard that is. Um, we we want to be focusing on the child's strengths. So one of the assessments that we want to share with you is um, this guide. It's called Assessing Communication and Learning in Young Children Who Are Deafblind or Who Have Multiple Disabilities. Um, and this was developed by Charity Rowland, who is um, down in Oregon. She is also the um, one of the authors of the Communication Matrix that we will be talking about in session three. And this assessment guide covers methods for assessment that take into consideration the unique access needs for a child who is deafblind, um, both for communication and cognitive development. And then also strategies that are needed to understand and support their learning. It can be used to help the team plan for an assessment, you know, organizing the team. How are you going to gather information? Um, how do you interpret the information that you get? And then finally, how do you apply that? Um, the great thing is that this PDF is available at no cost on the Design to Learn website under their Educational Resources tab. It's listed there under a different title. It's um, The title is Assessment Guide for Young Children Who Are Deafblind. And at the end of this presentation, um, we have some assessment resources and the, the link is there. Another assessment is the Child Guided Strategies, the Van Dyke approach to assessment. Um, Jan Van Dyke um, developed this approach um, to assess um, youth and children with sensory uh, disabilities and, and multiple disabilities. And rather than relying on standardized tests, it focuses on observing how children naturally interact with their environment, um, with other people, um, and it, the assessment really is um, guided based on the child's own cues, their interests, and their strengths. So really child-guided, following what they are interested in and what they're doing and, and building on that. And the goal is to tailor interventions and educational plans that support their unique communication, learning, and developmental pathway. Um, this method is particularly particularly important for children with complex needs who may not fit into traditional assessment frameworks. This assessment is no longer available in print, but it is available for, um, for free as a download, and the link is also in our resources there. 
at the end of this presentation. Another assessment that um, we wanted to share with you is called the Assessment of Deafblind Access to Manual Language Systems. This was developed um, by Robbie Blaha. And um, this assessment is used to determine supports for students who are using manual language systems. So that could be American Sign Language, Signed Exact English, Fingerspelling, Simultaneous Communication, um, it could even include speech reading or um, how a student is accessing things like facial expressions and gestures and body language or cued speech. And it assesses things like, do we need to modify the environment to make sure that the child has access? Do we need to make sure that uh, information is presented against a plain background, that they need um, lots of contrast or a spotlight on the person that's communicating with them? Um, how does glare factor into all of this? Um, what about their unique visual and auditory access? Do we need to be really close or further away because maybe they have field loss? And so being up close, they're missing some signs. Um, what about the use of touch? Do they need to have their hand on the wrist of somebody who's signing to help them with visual tracking? Or does their hand need to be on top of the other person's hands so that they can um, engage with tactile communication.